Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You guys, one of the only things that every nutritional expert that we've had on the show seems to actually agree on is that we all need to eat more vegetables, eat more greens, eat organic, cut out all the processed junk. Well, who has the time, right? Who has the time to go out, do the shopping, make the salads, make the juices, make the smoothies? And that's what I love so much about Organifi. Their product is an all organic green juice. It has all of the nutrients that you need. It tastes absolutely amazing. And it's made by wonderful people who I consider to be personal friends. And as listeners of this show, you guys can actually save 20% on your first order. And all you have to do is go to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com and use the coupon code SUPERHUMAN at checkout. This episode is brought to you by. Become a Super Learner, the masterclass. You guys, if you have ever wanted to learn things faster, to read faster and waste less time reading boring textbooks, if you've ever wanted to have near perfect memory for names, numbers, anything you want to learn and expand your mind and retain information in a way that you never thought possible well, then the Become a Super Learner Masterclass is exactly what you've been looking for. It's a 10-week program developed by myself and my mentors alongside some of the world's best memory experts and world record-holding memory champions. It'll take you from zero to super learning hero in just a matter of 10 weeks in about 30 minutes a day or less. Now, you can go ahead and sign up for a free trial with no credit card required. All you have to do is go to jle.vi slash learn, and if you choose to pick up the full course, you will also get an incredible discount for listeners of this podcast only. So please make sure to check it out and support the show, and on to today's episode. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's show. You guys might remember that last week I tease threatened that I'm going to continue doing the show as long as you guys continue sharing ideas and posting reviews. This week, we do have a review, so we do have an episode. Essentially, this episode is kind of sort of brought to you by Todor.m from Bulgaria, who says, my favorite podcast, five stars. This is probably the first podcast I listen on iTunes and one of the few that I've listened to every episode. So many awesome things to learn on different topics. Thank you so much, Todor, for making sure that I put out an episode this week. And for the rest of you guys, if you haven't left a review, well, leave a review so I can keep putting out episodes. They really give me the energy to do all the work, to produce the show, to uh, stand here in front of the microphone for hours and research guests and get them on the line. On to today's episode, you guys, today we are joined by Jenny Blake, and I have to tell you, she and I really, really hit it off. We really had a great time chatting. She's an author, a speaker, a career coach, business strategist, and much, much more. She wears a lot of different hats, uh, but she's mainly the author of Pivot, The Only Move That Matters Is Your Next. It's a great book about life path, deciding what's right for you, being happy and satisfied in your career. She also hosts a Pivot podcast and she has a private momentum community. She trains coaches all over the world. She's been featured on CNBC, New York Times, Sunday Times in the UK. Basically, she is an awesome superwoman and she shares a lot of my passions for entrepreneurship, lifestyle design, and as I found out, kind of surprisingly geeked out on productivity, productivity tools, and how to hack your workflow so that you can get more done. She and I both shared that uh, in the last few years, we have worked less than ever before and earned more and impacted more than we have in our lives. So you're going to get a ton out of this episode, guys. And if you listen to the end, Jenny also shares a lot of great free resources that you can download from her website to do some free homework and uh, decide if a pivot in your life is what 
what you need, what you need to do next. So without any further ado, I'm very excited to introduce you guys to my new super friend, Ms. Jenny Blake. Jenny, welcome to the show. We are so happy to have you today. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Doing well. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm really excited about this interview for a few different reasons. One is that I think you and I probably share a lot of values about life and calling and passion, but also you're a Silicon Valley native. Tell me a little bit about your trajectory, how you got started, how you got into what you're doing and why you made the move out of Silicon Valley. Cool. I can start by saying that if anyone has seen the TV show, Silicon Valley, it's pretty much a documentary. Yep. (laughs) As in, it is not even an exaggeration. I mean, it it is, but in so many ways, it captures the essence of the area perfectly. I grew up in San Francisco and then moved to Palo Alto for middle school and high school. So I got a little bit of the gritty city vibe and then total Palo Alto. Everyone's parents were either venture capitalists or Stanford professors, like Mm -hmm. very, very strange and wonderful place to grow up. And yeah, my, my general story is I, you know, what's funny. I came to New York city when I was nine years old and fell in love with it somehow. And to this day, when I walk over a subway grate, I live in New York, it's been six years and a whoosh of hot, stuffy subway air blows in my face and taken back to that moment when I'm nine years old. And so in some ways, I feel like I always wanted to get to New York and I loved growing up in Silicon Valley, but I always had an itch to leave and things kept keeping me there. So I went to UCLA, studied political science, ended up joining a startup with one of my professors for two years, hopped over to Google uh, when I kind of hit a plateau at the startup, was at Google for five and a half. And everything kept keeping me in the valley. So the startup was Palo Alto, Google, Mountain View. And so when I made the decision not to go back to Google after my first book was coming out, that's when I packed up my stuff, moved to New York City, and decided to go all in on seeing if I could make self-employment work. And it's been six years, definitely with ups and downs. But That's kind of what inspired me writing Pivot was this feeling that what's going on every few years, I keep hitting these plateaus and it always, it had seemed always like a crisis. And the more people I talk to, the more, this is really a natural thing that we're all doing. And so I really became passionate about figuring out, okay, well, if we're going to be changing much more often than even our parents, how do we get better at it? Brilliant. Wow, Jenny, I identified with so many different things that you said from the insularity of Silicon Valley all the way to this kind of feeling plateaued and feeling stuck. And I also identify, I mean, we haven't talked about Pivot. I want to get into more about what that is, but I I love that you've taken this super startup-y word. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And you've turned it into (laughs) real life wisdom because I think, you know, for all the fun that we Silicon Valley recovering Silicon Valley refugees, if you will, make of Silicon Valley. I think there's a lot of wisdom to be had if you can dig through all the kind of like BS and smelling their own uh, farts that Silicon Valley tends to do. (laughs) So tell me about about Pivot. Uh, The subtitle of the book is The Only Move That Matters Is Your Next One. Tell me about what drove you to write it and about really what the message is for folks who are going to read it. Sure. Well, it's really interesting. Just this last week, in the New York Times Magazine, there was an article pretty critical of the word pivot, actually. And the, the article was called something like, nobody fails anymore, they pivot. And that pivot <laughs> is just a fancy valley PR term to rebrand failure into some kind of seemingly intentional, methodical thing, when in fact, we're all just flailing around and we're calling it pivoting. That's a pretty cynical take. And I actually just as you said, I took this Silicon Valley kind of buzzword and I thought, okay, everyone's talking about all these sexy startups who keep pivoting and startups are this, we praise them for being agile and adaptable and able to change and Mm -hmm. evolve as circumstances unfold. And so my original question is how can people be as agile as startups? And as I started to study this and applying pivot to people, I realized that when startups talk about pivoting, it's often plan B, that the original strategy is failing, so they have to pivot to save the business. And when it comes to people, however, yes, of course, sometimes we pivot because of failure, but every bit as often, if not more so, we're pivoting as a result of our success. That actually, when we've outgrown our current career 
setup, we become ready to grow again and ready to pivot. And so in a personal sense, pivot can be a proactive way to say, and the other piece of it is how I define a pivot for individuals is doubling down on what's working to shift methodically into what's next. So a pivot is not a 180. It's not like I didn't leave Google to become a full-time yoga teacher. It's about I, you know, I was doing coaching and career development at Google and I left to do those things on my own. So a pivot is really about asking oneself, what is working best right now? Even within a business, how am I already earning clients? How are people already finding out about me? What are my strengths? When am I most in the zone? And what does success look like a year from now? I really don't believe in even asking or trying to look any farther out. I don't think it's <laughs> possible. That's why the subtitle you mentioned, it's kind of tongue in cheek. It's meant to say, The only move that matters is your next one. There's no point to try and know too many after that. So pivot is about saying, how can I look at what's already right under my feet, the skills and strengths and interests I already have, and then just build off of those into a new but related direction without starting from scratch. I love that. And I can so identify again, because that's been kind of my own personal story. And every time, you know, when I think of a pivot, either as someone who's built startups myself or someone who's invested in startups, I think of, you know, a bunch of people saying coming to the board or coming to the investors and saying, look, we were really excited about this. The data is not there. It's not working. But it does seem that people are really interested in this little tiny thing that we were doing on the side. And Mm -hmm. I found that to be, you know, my life's kind of journey as well. It's like, well, I really wanted to build this big Silicon Valley startup and that didn't really work out. But that little online course that I built on the side, well, that seems to really be working. Maybe I should just focus on that and pivot into that. And so I really, really love that. I think there's a huge message there to be said about like, you know, if you want to get into kind of the more spiritual of it, of like Mm. listening to where the universe is kind of putting you and paying attention to the signs because you'll eventually end up exactly where you need to be. Yes, 100%. And that usually it builds on experiences that we've had in our past. And we were just talking even before we hit record, your pivot to Tel Aviv, that that was both a life and a location pivot. And sometimes maybe even you're doing the same activities, but you just want to change the location up. Something that gives you an infusion of growth Mm -hmm. and new experiences. And I'm curious what your process was after you sold the startup, how you navigated that question of what's next. Yeah. Well, so I sold the startup and I was kind of miserable. I I should have been very happy. I had a big check in my pocket. I had a a fancy house and a fancy car and, and friends and, but I was unhappy and I felt unfulfilled and I felt that what I'd done previously, which was luxury goods in e-commerce, didn't have meaning and didn't have value. And I, I had the chance to meet some really great entrepreneurs from, you know, the founder of Twitter to Magic Johnson to Jean-Paul de Jaurier. And each of them kind of had alluded, told me, spoken on stage to the fact that, you know, doing good is good business and that, you know, your business activity should really make an impact on people. So I was in a kind of low place and I, you know, went to volunteer for a few weeks and then I applied to business schools abroad. And it was almost exactly like you say, just trying a bunch of different things, trying to launch a startup while I was uh, in business school, coming back to Silicon Valley to see if the shoes still fit, realizing that it didn't, coming to Israel, you know, working with advising 10 different startups to realize that none of them were the right thing and flying to two different countries in Africa, three different countries in Africa to look for opportunities to serve emerging markets, realizing that I didn't have value there. And And really just, uh, I give a lecture called uh, Failure as a Methodology for Success. And I really firmly believe that all those little mini pivots or failures, as you said, led me to where I am. And ultimately, my guiding principle was kind of listening to the data. And the data might be, Mm. well, you know, I've been working on this project for two months. I haven't been able to sell it to anybody. People aren't into it. Or the data of, you know what, I haven't wanted to get out of bed for the last four days. This probably isn't the right project to be working on. Yeah. I love how many little experiments you described as well. How much you just continually kept talking to people, meeting with people, trying things until you found a a set of activities that stuck. Yeah. It was reluctantly. I mean, like, uh, I think every entrepreneur suffers from this kind of visionary syndrome, where we want to build the things that we want to build so badly. And a lot of us start out and we say, I'm going to build the best X. And it doesn't really matter if people want that because that's our vision. 
Right. Every entrepreneurial venture that I've had that's failed miserably has started because I think I'm a visionary. And everyone that's succeeded mm. has started because I'm like, you know, people just won't stop asking me about this. They won't stop asking me where I got these luxury parts. So why don't I just put up a website and resell them? Or, you know, people won't stop asking me how to speed read. So why don't I just record some videos? You know, it's not as fulfilling or nourishing to the ego, but it works a hell of a lot better. And I think the same is true of life is it's one thing to be like, well, I want to be the CEO of a company. It's another thing to listen and say, you know, hey, people really love my music. People really love the art that I'm putting out into the world. Maybe I should listen to that feedback. I think this is one of the most hidden resources that we have for figuring out what's next is what are people asking for? And as you said, even for entrepreneurship, that mm -hmm. I even noticed that too. You know, I, I said in the, I just wrote the afterwards, the paperback edition of the book. And I said, even when the book launched, here I was, I wrote a book called Pivot. I still had no clue what was next. And actually, that was the point. And so in the last year since the book came out, I've really just been waiting to see what are people hiring me for? What are they asking me questions about? When the companies hire me to do stuff, okay, then I create products that kind of meet what they've asked. And it's also been interesting to notice people asking me, oh, are you going to train more Pivot coaches? I would love to sign up. So now I have a wait list for something that I was kind of on the fence about whether to do any bigger pivot coach training, but maybe I will simply because that's where the actual demand seems to be compared to, as you said, just having some idea that isn't rooted in what people actually mm -hmm. need or want. Mm -hmm. And that's my motto for life generally, which is just how can I be as helpful as possible to as many people as possible? And I think if you're going to create a book or a business, or a product or service, it's about asking, in some ways, how are people hurting? What's broken? What's inconvenient? Mm -hmm. What's upsetting, confusing? That it, Otherwise, it, it can be sexy to think of like, oh, this is going to streamline people's lives somehow, but not if they don't know that they need it. Yeah. But I think also it's a tough balance because sometimes the things that we're best at or that people demand from us, uh, we kind of get typecast into a role and they're not the things that make us happy. So for example, one of my best friends in the whole wide world spent years at Facebook as you spent at Google and mm. he left Facebook and on the side has done Facebook ads. He runs our Facebook ads and he's a wizard. I mean, he's a mm. phenomenal, just f does incredible, incredible work does not enjoy the work at all. And yet, you know, really? I, I have friends knocking down my door saying like, give me his contact info. I see your ads everywhere. I tell them about what we're doing with Facebook ads and the innovation that we've added. And they're just dying, dying to work with him. And he's like, I really don't want more clients. I really want to build my next startup. So what do you have to say to that? I mean, how do you balance that out between satisfaction and what people are asking for? So glad you brought up that example. A couple things come up. One, uh, Gay Hendricks in his book, The Big Leap, he talks about how we all have four zones, a zone of incompetence, competence, like, yeah, you can get the job done. Excellence, you're actually good at that job and a zone of genius. And it sounds mm -hmm. like your friend is in his zone of excellence. He's good at it. He's delivering it, but it's not his zone of genius. He's, I mean, even if it's the output is genius, as you even described, he doesn't feel like that. Right. The second thing, many, many people have some kind of side hustle, even if they're an entrepreneur, that is funding the stuff they really want. So there's nothing wrong with using a skill set like that to build a runway or an incubator for the thing that he really wants to do. So sometimes it's just about shifting the mindset of, hey, this isn't forever. It's serving a very important function, which is bringing in revenue while I build this other thing. Totally. And the third thing I would say is it sounds like he really has an opportunity to create some systems around his process and even bring on one or two people below him, teach them how to do his method so that he's managing the work that's getting done. And he may even still approve it, but he's not the one in the trenches because I can understand that for someone as strategic as he is and experienced, he doesn't necessarily need to be the one writing ad copy but he could easily systematize and delegate and automate in such a way that he could still earn that income, but not be doing all the work. Totally. I agree with you completely once again. Jenny, I want to ask you, because I want to get into kind of some practical stuff for our audience. I want to ask, how do people know if they need a pivot? I mean, I've talked to a lot of people 
and I'm kind of very outspoken about loving what I do most days. The last couple of days, not as much, but most days I love what I do. <laughs> and people have often told me, they're like, well, you know, not everyone is as lucky as you. You know, a lot of people just hate their work and do their job just to pay the bills. And I don't agree with that. And I sense that you don't agree with that. And so I'd, I'd love to ask, what are the signs that people need a pivot? And then the next question is, how do they go about mustering the courage? Because I know it's very easy yeah. for us entrepreneurs to be like, well, I failed. All right, now what? But you know, for someone who's in a steady job or in a steady, maybe they're doing a PhD program that they just don't love, it's pretty hard to walk away. Yeah, definitely. Well, sometimes we go through a dip or you just need rest. Like in your case, if the last few days have kind of been a dip, it may be that you need to just take a break and step away. And that may or may not mean that you come back and make some changes. But in your case, let's say in a, in a short term situation where you generally like the macro container that you're in, you might look at and see, well, what am I doing that's really working and that I, I look forward to on my to-do list? And how could I stop or delegate some of the stuff that is grading and just bringing, weighing you down, causing friction? So I'm a big fan of systems and delegation for that kind of stuff. But then for someone who is, and absolutely, I don't agree that, oh, well, a lot of people really hate their jobs doesn't mean we should just sit here and <laughs> be complacent. I mean, I wrote this book, I call them for a high net growth individual, but we've heard the term high net worth, but money is not everything. And especially if you're a high net growth individual, you are going to get antsy. You are going to get bored and you are not going to be happy to just work for the money alone. Like you described with your first mm -hmm. startup. I talked to a lot of people who are in marketing or finance jobs where they feel empty and they want work that has more of a legacy behind it. So for the person who, how do you know you're at a pivot point? Well, if you feel bored, if you feel kind of blah, like you look ahead and you're not that excited, you don't feel that you're using your best strengths or talents. You don't really look forward to what you're doing. You don't feel that it's making an impact and you don't feel like you're growing. And this could be any spectrum of this. It could be a vague whisper or it could be just a loud screaming, mm -hmm. you know, universe is trying, doing everything it can to get your attention kind of a thing. And the key is to not try and solve the whole thing overnight. It's not to quit your job and start a company immediately. It's look for small ways that you can pilot or experiment with potential solutions, just like you described, Jonathan, where maybe someone can take on one small side project or pitch in on a project at work that's not on their team or that's in an area they're interested in or that would give them great connections or experiences. So the pivot process is not about trying to crack the career conundrum all at once. That's very overwhelming. And it often sends people into a panic zone. Like if they thought they had to quit their job and start from scratch, it would be terrifying. But instead thinking about what is it, do you have ideas of what you want to do? How can you build off of where you are right now and then set up experiments that would just take an hour a week or a couple hours a week that allow you to understand what I call the three E's. Do I enjoy this new area? Can I become an expert at it? And is there room to expand either within your team, within the company or within the marketplace? I love that. The message that I really take away from that is, you know, progress, not perfection, as a friend of mine often tells me, but also just this kind of meta observational process of testing and then listening to yourself and to your environment and kind of not doing things in one foul sweep because you think that's the way that it, it works in the movies where, you know, someone packs their shit and takes off, but rather going in slowly, cautiously testing, gathering data. I mean, it, it really, yeah. I think the title of your book is perfectly chosen because it so mirrors the way that data driven companies or startups mm -hmm. really get into change and create innovation. Yeah. And just finding the one next step, which is one next thing you can do. And if someone's feeling stuck, it's very easy to focus on what's not working and what you don't want and what you don't have. And that doesn't ultimately propel the conversation forward. So better if you can take some time, even if it's all happening internally right now, to say, what is working? What do I enjoy? What am I looking forward to? What do people come to me for advice on? What problems are people asking me to solve or can I solve? I really like that. And I also, I share your belief that I think everyone has a gift to give, not my idea. I believe I lifted it from Tony Robbins, but this idea that, as you said, 
based on someone's biography, no matter who you are and no matter what you've experienced, good or bad in life, that uniquely suits you to solve problems for people who have faced similar successes, challenges, whatever it may be in their own lives. And so it, it really is, as you said, all about service, whether that's serving a market, serving people, serving a community. Yes, absolutely. And that ultimately, that's what's so rewarding is feeling, yes, I'm growing personally and I'm making an impact and serving. Absolutely. Even if it's, and it doesn't have to be serving the world. You know, not everyone's going to have the same grandiose vision, but even just serving a small population that you care about makes a big impact. Definitely. As I said, I've made a living off helping people serve their egos with fancy, you know, luxury goods. And I've made a living off mm -hmm. helping people achieve their goals with accelerated learning courses. And it's not only a lot more profitable to help people in a real mm -hmm. way that impacts their lives, it's also a lot more rewarding. Mm, love it. Yes, absolutely. So Jenny, I want to ask you, because I think probably the biggest challenge I'm going to guess that you face with your readers, one of my biggest challenges is getting people to actually do the homework in my courses. But I imagine the biggest challenge when people read your book is getting them to just start. I often believe or tell people that I think that life follows Newton's laws of motion, <laughs> meaning that a body in motion wants to stay in motion, but a body at rest wants to stay at rest. And if people don't make even just one small, simple change, that they'll stay at rest. And I imagine that it's pretty hard to break that resting inertia. So I wanted to ask you, long way to ask a simple question, what homework would you assign to people? If I could promise you that everyone in the audience was going to do a piece of homework this week, what would you give them? Mm. Well, one of the most important steps of pivoting is crafting a one-year vision of what does success look like, even if you don't know specifics, because if you did, you might already be working toward them. But one year from now, what does success look like? How do you want to feel every day? How do you want to learn and grow? What kind of impact do you want to be making? What is your ideal average day? Who are you surrounded by? Where are you living? All these details. And if I had to give really specific homework, I even have a, a template that I call the ideal day Mad Lib, where you can just fill in the blanks. Like I've written a five page broad kind of like uh, take you through a day in the life and then you can fill in the blanks. And um Something like that is great because it just helps set a vision for what you're working toward. And you can start to filter next steps through the lens of that vision of does this align with what I see for myself or what would make me happy, how much you want to be earning or not. And so the vision is really important because otherwise we tend to be guided by fear or, you know, not on purpose, but it's just much easier to think about, well, if I quit my job, I'm going to be doomed. Like, or if I can't make a living, here's the worst case scenario. And the vision counters that by providing something really clear and compelling that motivates you to get off the couch. And I do think rest is really important, but like you said, too much mm -hmm. sitting and thinking isn't going to produce any data as we've talked about. So anyway, if anyone wants that, it's at pivotmethod.com slash ideal day. Awesome. So let's assign that to the listeners. I would love if people would do that because I really believe in action. If you're listening, you've already, you've been assigned. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So I want to get into some more kind of rapid fire questions. Uh, just a little bit about you, because, you know, I think just given the fact that you were a Googler and what you've accomplished with your book, I, I would say you're a pretty high performing superhuman yourself. So I'd love to hear about mm -hmm. any kind of skills or habits or routines that you feel help you perform at a higher level, whether that's nutrition or exercise or meditation or any of that. Oh, yeah. Well, I love thinking about all of that. One of my mottos is your body is your business, especially if you're a solopreneur. Your body is a hugely critical piece of how your company is going to perform and uh, or your sole employee. In this case, it's me. <laughs> so uh, I can answer all those questions in a flash and then we can go into more of them if you want. But uh, I do place a lot of emphasis on morning and evening routines. I meditate. I read for one or two hours every morning. Wow. I do intermittent fasting where I don't eat until 2 or 3 p.m. And I actually just did a three-day fast just for the mental exercise of it, which was wild. We can come back to that. But intermittent fasting, I do tea with brain octane in the morning. That's kind of like a modified bulletproof. Mm -hmm. And then by not eating, I stay really sharp. Just my, you know, when you eat, blood rushes to your stomach. So with intermittent fasting, I feel really sharp and alert and clear most of the day. 
And then I have a meal usually in the afternoon or dinner. I've been meditating for five years and I've been doing Pilates for five and yoga for 15. So those are my physical movement practices and walking and yoga and Pilates keep me just flexible, agile in mind, the kind of mind body connection there. I don't even do strength training at the gym, but those two, because they're whole body, I really appreciate them and I can do them anywhere. So I work in a, and live in a studio apartment with my partner, Michael, and uh, so we don't have a ton of space, but I can always find room to unroll the yoga mat or when I'm traveling in a hotel room. So I like also that those can come with me. And then I pretty much stop checking email. Once I leave the house in the afternoon for coffee with a friend or yoga, I don't do work after that. I'm not a night owl. I really, when I come home, I have dinner and then wind down and go to bed, but I'm not, I don't put pressure on myself. I have to say this year, my sixth year in business, and I finally hit a tipping point where I'm earning more than I've ever earned. And I'm working far less, maybe 10 to 15 hours a week. I had that same tipping point. It's it's incredible. (laughs) It's amazing. It's like working 10 years to get here, 10 or 11, since I started my first blog. So yeah, that's cool. When did you hit yours? Uh, Honestly, about one year into running this business. But for me, I attributed it to the lessons that I learned in my last business, mainly being Mm -hmm. that I need to leverage technology and automation and really change the way that I look at capitalism and how money works. And that making money is just a way of delivering value. And therefore, you don't actually need human beings such as myself or even my employees to deliver that value. That was the major tipping point that whether or not I work, systems are automated to help people listen to podcasts, learn online courses, all that kind of stuff. Fascinating. What's the system that you're proudest of creating? Honestly, it's one that doesn't actually generate revenue for us, but it's an internal Mm. training course that we built. We have an online course called Superhuman Enterprises 101. If anyone is listening, it is not available to you. (laughs) It is definitely (laughs) closed to anyone, you know, outside of our company, but it's uh, basically an online course with hundreds of lectures and everyone in the company participates in creating it and it's collaborative and it's always evolving. Basically everything that happens in the company from how we answer emails to what softwares we use to how our marketing funnels work, it's all documented in there. So we just hired uh, two new people last week, two new part-time people. And all I have to do is add them to this online course and say, here are the sections that are assigned to you. You start next week. That is so awesome. So you're saying every person in the company are continually updating this course with how things work. In theory, yeah. I have to admit that we innovate so quickly on some of the marketing funnel stuff and we test so much different new stuff that it changes faster than we can keep it updated. But then I've built in a self kind of regulating mechanism that every new hire, their first task is to make suggestions for how the course was unclear to them. I love it. That is so great. This whole podcast like is gold for this nugget. Like everybody (laughs) who's running any kind of enterprise, that is genius. Why, thank you. It it was a shower innovation when I realized like, uh, you know, we create online courses. So I think everyone who works in our company needs to understand what it's like to take an online course and what it's like to create an online course. So I'm quite proud of that. Yeah. (laughs) That is awesome. I absolutely love it. And I love how new hires also start by making suggestions. So they're experiencing it and they already get to jump in and help improve things and they have the freshest eyes. So that's so smart. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. What's uh, your system that you're most proud of? Well, I just did an eight week course called Delegation Ninja and that was really fun. I have to say, I just had a blast creating it. And um, you know, what's funny because I do have a lot of systems that I employ in my business. But some of the ones I'm most excited to be piloting are on the personal front that actually, because I really love doing business stuff. For example, I'm about to start one of those meal delivery services where they send three meals and you cook, get recipes and learn to cook. Cool. Can't wait. I had this thing where I figured out that my dry cleaner will come pick up the laundry and the dry cleaning, not just drop it off when it's done, but pick it up and finding out little things like that, that just reduce friction of having a pile sitting by the front door or waiting to go till I have three hours in the day to go do laundry. Things like that. I love figuring out like when something is out in my house, let's say I'm on the last paper towel 
or let's say 10 paper towels away, I add it to my Amazon cart the moment I notice. So I'm never Mm -hmm. without these things. Like there's just, I try not to think about little things more than once. So paper towels are almost out. Okay. Add it to my cart right now. It doesn't matter if I check out at this moment. And then in business, using Asana with my assistant and my team, Marisol yes. and my VA team has been a complete game changer. It has made it so easy to track what everybody's up to, what's due when things really do not fall through the cracks anymore, whereas they were before. We And we tried every task management system that you could, but Asana finally did the trick. Yeah, we use Asana as well. Although right now we're at the point where so much exists in Asana, like everything in our company yeah. exists in there and it's become this monster. So I'm going back to the foundations actually in a tab right now. I have Asana project organization self tutorial open because I want to kind of go back and see if we can reorganize how projects are done and, and how things are yeah. organized. But that's also, we train people in our online course, how exactly we use Asana and how to drag tasks in the right way because we use it in our own kind of different way. I did want to say though, I'm also a huge fan of the automation and basically taking as many things out of my pipeline as possible. You know, with Amazon, you can order a little button that you put in your pantry. Oh yeah, I have a dash button. So great. I don't have it because we don't have Amazon here, but. Oh, okay. Because I have a dash button for a toilet paper because I was like, that's the one thing I know I'll always need to push a button and get. Right. Uh, What's funny is that one time I accidentally pushed it and got just so much toilet paper delivered to my house. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing more dash buttons. I feel like for really key staples, because in the beginning when I first I like trying stuff this early. I'm not the earliest adopter, but when I first got dash, there were only a few products that you could choose. Mm -hmm. Now I think you can connect it to almost anything. And then I got Alexa when it was not even out yet. Like I like trying these things, even though I think she's probably spying on us. Oh, she's Um, definitely spying on you. I know. I'm a big fan of all this. I mean, like I actually teach a whole course on this, not to plug it, but like. Love it. I love how many courses you have. (laughs) <laughs> so this is part of the whole automation thing is like if more than two or three people ask me to explain something, I usually record a video and or a course on it. Mm. And the productivity course came out of I used to host friends before I worked at WeWork, I would host friends in my home. And we would kind of work from my kitchen table. And people would always be kind of like looking over my shoulders. And they're like, wait, how did you do that? Wait, how, what, <laughs> what just ha- like all your files are automatically organized? What? So I, I've Love automated it. things to a like ridiculous extreme. Like I don't touch light switches in my house because they illuminate based on kind of my schedule and the lights all dim and turn off <gasps> at certain hours. And when I walk into a room, the lights turn on and like I've taken it really, really far. Like all my invoices are auto filed and it's kind of ridiculous. Well, what do you think about the house of uh, the internet of things? Like how you described your house? Do you ever worry that it could be hacked by having all of your things and your whole house kind of online? I do. But if someone wants to control my lights, like I don't see the harm (laughs) in it, you know, like uh, when I start getting like my body online, (laughs) that would probably concern me. But I mean, my fridge isn't connected to the internet or anything like that. But yeah, all the lights in the house, all the air conditioners, I love it. It's so cool. I love how much we can control from our phones now. I mean, mm-hmm. our phones are so powerful. Like so many people I know barely even need a laptop. The other game changer I use, and I can't wait. I hope I get to take your productivity course soon. But uh, Text Expander, do you use this? Oh, yeah. So I use the native yeah. ones built into all the iOS devices so that it's synchronized. But that's like one of my oh, biggest nice. tips is, you know, how many times a day you type in yeah. your email, like when you sign up for new services or totally. someone asks you. So I have a, a shortcut for that, for addresses, for even long stuff that I write out, like, thanks so much for sending an email. I read it with oh, great, yeah. you know, blah, 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 blah. And then I have a little space in the middle that I fill in the personalized stuff. So love it. Awesome. So that was a a lovely productivity tangent. (laughs) (laughs) Let me ask this. What are some other kind of products or services that you really couldn't live without? Oh, well, there is the huge, the usuals like Evernote, Dropbox. I mean, those are Mm -hmm. my staples. These are, I read an article calling them the new utility companies. And I think it's true. Like Google Mm -hmm. everything. All my files are on Dropbox so that I can access any file from any device, which Mm -hmm, is really mm -hmm. helpful, especially while traveling, being able to send people things. And then I don't have to do manual backups. So I think this is an obvious tip by now, but it's just a game changer for me constantly. Yep. Yep. 
here's a tiny tool that some people might not know about, but Captio for iOS and maybe for Android. Captio is a software where you just open it and can type your memo to yourself and hit send. And it emails yourself rather than having to actually email yourself by opening up your email client, typing, hitting new, writing your email address and a subject and sending it. So Captio is a really great just like note. That's to cool. That's cool. Yeah. I use a uh, mail to self. So if I'm on any web page, anywhere, oh. I can just hit, you go to the little share menu and you can hit mail to self, but I'll check out Captio. Love it. Captio is great for your phone. Very cool. Yeah. You're just talking to someone. Oh, I got to remember that. And you just open Captio, type it and hit send. It just reduces a certain number of steps from actually emailing yourself. Give us one of your must apps. Okay, like I'm giving away the farm here because this is like one of the best tricks. And I'm going to send you the productivity course. I think you're going to like it a lot. But um, followupthen.com. This is a game changer. Is that so, different than follow up CC? Or is it the same? I think it's roughly the same. I'm not sure. I'll, okay. I'll pop open follow up CC. But I send out follow ups like 100 times a day. Someone tells me, yeah, I'll check in on it next week. I send it to next week at followupthen.com and they email me, yeah. but it also does recurring. So if I want to meet with someone every month, I'll send an email to every 15 days or every 30 days at followupthen.com. I'll CC them and then it'll just email me every 30 days. Love it. And you can do all kinds of like weird stuff. So if you have a romantic partner and you want to know when you need to bring home chocolates and uh, my doll you can send to every 28 days at ah. followupthen.com and it's a uh, it's one of my best relationship tips let me tell you <laughs> that is so funny what's hilarious is the tmi i just said to like my partner last night i was like just crying for no reason and i'm like you know what you might as well just make a note of it like once a month <laughs> Like, yes. Just expect it. If you're wondering why I'm like uh, crying for no reason, here it is. Yep. I can't yep. explain it other than that. So follow up then. Have follow up CC for that purpose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or mind follow up CC. But yeah, I use that all the time as well. And even some of my notes to self, I don't even bother sending through Captio. I just do like December 1 at follow up .cc, mm -hmm. And then I give my note what I might need to remember in December. So. Yep. Or Asana. Yeah. I was just going to say, I do that all the time, but I've actually started for the a lot of the recurring stuff. Like, you know, it, we donate 5% of our revenues from Super Learner Academy to charity. And I used to just send myself a link to their donation page for the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. But now I just put it into Asana as a recurring task because it feels good to click done, you know? <laughs> mm, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, awesome. So I wanted to ask you one more question before I let you go. You said you read one to two hours a day, which is incredible and a really, really great habit. I want to ask you, I'm not going to make you choose a book that's changed your life. I'm going to ask you for a list of books that have changed your life. Oh, great. Okay. Love it. Oh, so many, so many. Okay. Well, it depends. Do you want like on the business or the spiritual side or? Give me all of them. I think if it's if it's books that have truly changed my life, I loved, it's a quirky book called Outrageous Openness by Tosha Silver. It's about serendipity and uh, just and surrender and flow, kind of finding flow in life. I really loved that book. Loving What Is by Byron Katie. It was just a game changer for rewiring my thinking. And she says that any thought that causes stress you can choose a different one. And it's this really interesting process of replacing thoughts over and over again, as you find yourself believing things that aren't true or thoughts that are causing stress. And she said, every stressful thought is a compassionate alarm clock, encouraging us to wake up. So wow. that book really helped me kind of rewire my brain. Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. I just love the concept. The subtitle is Things That Gain From Disorder. Mm -hmm. And he's a great writer, funny, reverent. So I enjoy reading his stuff. Really smart. 10% Happier. Great book on meditation, especially if you're new to the practice. Mm -hmm. Anchor had a panic attack on national television. And this is his, he's a fidgety skeptic that found his way to meditation. And uh, I could truly go on and on and on, but I think I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> That's a good solid list for sure. So many. I have so many more. It does. It hurts me to have to narrow it even to those. Uh, also the Tao Te Ching. That's like a classic. That I yes, really, really good one. So, all right, I'm going to let you go, I promise, on time. 
Although we've really hit it off and I'd love to keep in yeah. contact and chat, but I wanted to ask you our kind of last question before the last question though, where can people reach out and learn more about you and where should we send them to get in touch with you? Well, thank you so much. I know we're both going to have to set up follow-ups. Uh, yes. Follow-up, <laughs> follow-up <laughs> CC. Or a sauna <laughs> yeah. Best place is pivotmethod.com slash toolkit. There's a ton of free resources and templates on a lot of the concepts that we talked about today. And then if anyone wants help planning a next move, I have a great team of pivot coaches. So that's pivotmethod.com slash coaching. And I also run a private community where I do Q and a calls every two weeks and that's pivotmethod.com slash momentum. So I would love to keep in touch with any of you listening. And if you do the ideal day exercise, send us an email and let us know how it goes. Awesome. Okay. We'll put all those links into the blog post for the episode. So I want to ask you the final last question, which is if people are really only able to remember one message and they take that message with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? Mm, Great question. One message. The one that uh, sort of a default is just start small which is weird. I used to have this mantra or message like live big. And yes, I believe in that live big, but also start small. That just, Mm. there's very tiny things that you can do and you only ever have to know the next step. So if you start small and you just start building momentum, you will be shown the way. And uh, the other message, if I could, I think really what I live by is faith in flow that at some point it's not just about doing and muscling our way into things, but having faith in the flow of our lives and events and people who cross our paths. And for me, faith in flow is the most peaceful way to live because I stop attaching to circumstances or outcomes and I just go with what shows up. Brilliant. Brilliant and wise words to end on. Jenny, I really, really want to thank you. I really enjoyed this call. It's my last uh, work thing for the week and I couldn't have asked for a higher note to end on. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jonathan. It's been such a joy for me too. Thanks for all these awesome questions and big thanks to everybody for listening. Awesome. Let's absolutely keep in touch. Yeah. I love that you're such a productivity like geek too. It's so great. Oh, I'm a total geek. I've already enrolled you in our class. It's already in your email inbox. So check it out. Thank you. You know, one I thought about learning how to create a bot and creating a bot for some of my stuff. I'm curious if you've done that yet. I haven't, like but I'm surrounded at WeWork by a team of three people and I'm in the middle of their team. Like somehow it worked out that my desk is in between <laughs> all three of the team members, but they do chatbots and they keep trying to get me to do one. They keep trying to get me to do one, but yeah. uh, they can't get me to sit still long enough to explain to them what I want to do. I know. Oh, so interesting. All right. Well, that's what I, I'd be curious. Um, that's what I love. Thank you for adding me to the productivity course already. I'm so excited to check it my out. My pleasure. My pleasure. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, say goodbye to stop the recording, but we can wrap after. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today, but I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.